All right, if you have your Bible this morning, turn to Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> Title of this message is A Good Father. A Good Father. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. The Bible says, And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one, for he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. While he yet spake, there cometh one from uh, the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to, to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, <clears throat> Fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into his house, or when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out, and took her by the hand, and, and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. May we understand what a good father is. It may be a little bit different than what most people think. But we're reading about a good father here. and what he did for his family. And I guess if you can do what he did, you'll go into the category of a good father. I pray you bless our time together and ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. I think her song got me all, <clears throat> all weepy about it. I'll step it up here in a minute. Um... The amazing thing about Jairus and what makes him a, a good father, uh, he was not ashamed to see Jesus Christ. If you, I mean, maybe your dad taught you how to hit a ball. Maybe he, he taught you sports. Maybe he taught you how to fish. Maybe he taught you how to hunt. But that's what, not what makes a good father. What makes a good father is one's not ashamed to see Jesus Christ. And when, when it came down to uh, the, the plight or the death of his daughter, or, listen, he was dealing with her eternity. Uh, he did what he needed to do. And let me tell you something. The opposition that he was facing, it's amazing here that this man did what he did. Um, it says, there came a man. Here comes this man. Something has driven him. The love for his family, the love for his daughter... The thought of losing her. <clears throat> you know, that does bring some men to Christ. They may not be thinking of themselves, and maybe they wouldn't even do it for their own selves, but they'll do it for their kids. And when they start thinking about their children, and they start thinking about eternity, and they start thinking about uh, eternal things, all of a sudden they're willing to do things they weren't willing to do before. I know we got, we got out from the Lord for a while, and then we had children. And that changed everything. I mean, we could be selfish and, and live our lives for ourselves, but what about our children? 
If our children didn't get saved because we did not show them a pattern or we did not uh, live a proper testimony in front of them, they might perish because we're selfish. And so we got back in church. Didn't do it for myself necessarily. I'm glad I did. I'm doing it for me now. But we did it because we, did, we were having children and we thought, I'm not going to have my children perish no matter what. So here comes this man. There's this throng around Jesus Christ. I mean, he's being thronged by people that want to be healed. He's got a woman reaching out, trying to grab his garment. And this man, Jairus, shows up, seeking the man, Jesus Christ. It's interesting that one of the definitions of the word Jairus means he will awaken. And Jesus came, or Jairus came to Jesus even though he had a lofty position. He was a ruler in the synagogue. That means all eyes were on him too. He had a lofty position. J Jairus came to Jesus even though it was very public. Very public. I mean, even Nicodemus didn't have the courage to come to him in the daytime. He showed up at night. Here's Jairus. Jairus is on a, he is on a mission. His daughter's life is at stake. And he only knows of one man that can help him. He didn't send his wife or the neighbor kid or a servant, but he came himself. You know, uh, a lot of men, they send you to church. You know, they, they're trying to help you out by proxy. <laughs> and maybe trying to help themselves out. They're just smart enough to know, and I'm talking about lost men, smart enough to know that their family needs something. So they said, oh yeah, you all go to church, you know, I won't be going, but you can go. <laughs> no, he came himself. You say, why? He was a good father. I don't know what else he was. Maybe he was nothing. Maybe he didn't do anything for him the rest of his life. All I know is he came to Jesus when they needed him. Jair stepped up to the plate when it came to the salvation of his house. He stepped up. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's interesting, this passage in Romans 10.11 says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I don't know if that is a fact or a commandment. I've always wondered about that. Because I've kind of known some men that were kind of ashamed. Do you know Jairus, to believe on Jesus Christ, to believe that he could heal his daughter, he couldn't be ashamed. He had to go directly up to the man. He had to ask that his daughter be, uh, that, to come and heal and save his daughter. He was not ashamed to bring the Lord Jesus Christ into his home. <laughs> One thing to go out there and meet him, another thing to bring him home with you. And I'll tell you what, a good father will bring Jesus Christ into his home. It says there in verse 41, he besought him that he would come into, the, come into his house. The ridicule and persecution he received for this did not deter him. And no doubt he did receive ridicule and persecution being a ruler of a synagogue. You can just imagine what he had to put up with. But this man was a good father and was willing to do that. He was going to as any good father would, sacrifice himself. Sacrifice his living. Sacrifice his position. Sacrifice his standing to save his family. This was by far the single greatest decision of Jairus' life. By far. I don't think there's any greater decision to bring Jesus into your home to bring Jesus into your life is one of the greatest decisions of your life. It's definitely the most important. I tell people that the greatest day of your life is the day you got saved. You just don't know it yet, but you will. You will know it, that it is the greatest day of your life. Um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The Bible talks about not being ashamed of things. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, for, for which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. 
Jairus had to face all that. He had to face the fears. He had to face the shame. He had to make a decision. The third thing is he didn't let his religion keep him from Jesus. You know how many people let their religion keep them from getting saved? You know what religion is? Religion is nothing but self-righteous works. That's what religion is. And it's the one thing that will damn you. People say, well, I just don't care for that religion stuff. I say, well, I'm not preaching any. I'm not preaching any religion. Because if you get saved, it won't be by your works. It'll be by, it'll be by the grace of God. And he didn't let his religion keep him, uh, keep him from Jesus. He was a ruler of the synagogue. Um, fourth thing is, he did not panic at the news, but stayed by the Lord's side. It's interesting to me that uh, of, even when you come to Jesus, it seems like there's uh, forces at work, things happening. Here he's, he's got this throng going on, and everybody's surrounding him. I'm sure that Jairus is trying to stay, Jairus is trying to stay close to him and keep guiding him to his house. When all of a sudden, the Lord just stops dead in his tracks. Who touched me? <laughs> Jairus is going, what? I'm touching you. I got your arm. <laughs> other, other people are touching him. Who touched me? He goes, what's going on here? We, we need to get to my daughter. He didn't panic. He didn't run off. He didn't leave. He didn't get mad. He didn't scream. He just, he waited. That waiting on God. You know, sometimes it takes a little while to get saved. You just end up having to kind of wait on the Lord. You, you ever, I've heard people tell me, that, man, you know, I started this, and like six months later, then I got saved. It took some time. And this took some time, and it's being patient and waiting on the Lord. But I'm sure that Jairus was just, she's sick. She's really bad. She's really, really bad. Can you imagine? How anxious he was. And some other woman that had just as much need, that suffered for so long, reached out and touched him. By the time he gets done dealing with that situation, then the messenger shows up and says, she's dead. Don't bother him about it anymore. Had to hit him like a ton of bricks. That's when the Lord said, fear not, believe only. Jairus' daughter would be one of three that Jesus would raise from the dead during his earthly ministry. Only one of three. I mean, Jairus could have ran off when he received the news, but he stayed by Jesus' side. Sometimes you get interrupted he got interrupted, he got detained, and then she died. But you know what? The Lord said, fear not. We talked about that in Sunday school, putting those fears under control. If the Lord says, fear not, only believe, then that's what you do. You believe. Fifth point is that parents usually are astonished when they bring the Lord Jesus Christ into the lives of their children. I know I have been. I've been astonished. I've been astonished at some of these kids, man, and, and their love for the Lord, their uh, love for Scripture. But the fact that they just get saved delights me. Maybe your dad wasn't wonderful. Maybe he never taught you a thing. But if he brought you to Jesus... If he brought Jesus into your home, I don't care how sorry he was, he was a good father. Because what he did for you, 95% of the fathers out there don't do for their families. You are in the smallest of the smallest minority because he did you the greatest thing he could possibly do. He brought life into your life. He brought eternal life into your life. And there can't be anything more important than that. Now, I had parents who were lost. You can't expect lost people to bring uh, Jesus into your home. You wouldn't think that would happen. But if you had saved, if you had saved parents, um, 
Like I said, maybe they didn't do nothing else for you. Maybe, maybe they were a failure when it comes to parenting. But if they brought you to Jesus, that's saying a lot. Listen, when eternity begins, you're going to remember that. You're not going to remember all the failures. You might remember them now, but you're not going to remember them then. You're going to remember, man, it was because of my dad that we got saved. And like Timothy, he's going to think that way of his grandmother and his mother. This is Mother's Day. We just preach this thing a little bit differently. It's because of mom. doesn't matter which parent brings him in, as long as they bring him in the house. As long as they get you to him. That's what's important. <clears throat> Jairus' decision that day ensured forever that his family would be together in eternity. Ensured it. You can't watch Jesus Christ raise somebody from the dead and not believe on him. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. I mean, you talk about lifelong believers. Every time mom looked at the daughter, every time Jairus looked at, her, looked at his daughter, he remembered. I guess that's one reason I think it makes him a good father is the world needs men that are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I remember when I first got saved, how much shame I had. Just fleshly shame of being associated because I came, I came from a family that never acknowledged him, only to use his name as a curse word. And I had good parents. I loved my parents. <laughs> I miss them terribly. I know that one of them at least got saved, and I hope both of them did. But it had been so much different if they had brought, Je if my dad or my mom had brought Jesus home. A wife needs a husband that's not ashamed of Jesus Christ. It's hard enough raising kids without both of you being a witness to them. There's things that God tells you to do, and, I, and I'm telling you that when you follow what the Lord says, it brings Jesus into their life just a little bit earlier. I, don't, I wouldn't want to wait till they're teenagers. I wouldn't want to wait that long. And when children see that, not religion, not your self-righteous attitude, not your, you know, we got all these standards, that's all separate stuff. They see Jesus Christ in your life. They see you worshiping a God that you say that you love. They see that, and with all your imperfections, they still see it. And that's what draws them. That's what makes them yield when they're young. It becomes almost, I mean, they just come around one day. Both my children just, all of a sudden, just one one day, one the next. One at four, one at six. I can't explain that. I know that they were exposed to it. We certainly weren't perfect parents. But yet, they recognized that at least we, we acknowledged him, we worshipped him, we prayed to him, we loved him, and they could sense that. And as a result, they, they wanted to be saved. Your children will do the same thing. But parents today, they're so selfish that, you know, they sacrifice, sacrificing this precious time when we could be home sleeping or doing something else rather than be in church exposing our children to the gospel. That's part of it. And that's not all of it. Because it's not just here. In fact, it's probably more important when it's at your home. And they see that. When they, when they hear you talking about the Bible, when you're talking about the rapture and the second coming and eternity, and, you know, what, we're going, what, what will it be like? They listen to that and they think, well, I want to be a part of that. I want that. And they begin to listen up. It has an effect. And you say, what is that? That's Jairus bringing home Jesus. That's you, Dad. 
bringing it into your home, bringing him into your home. And it has an effect. Now, what your kids do after they get saved and how they, and how they perform is one thing, but man, you at least want them to be saved. That is bare minimum. Once they're saved, I mean, the kind of the load comes off, you know. Some of them, you know, maybe, maybe later on in life, they'll, they'll turn around and do something for the Lord. Maybe they won't do anything. I don't know, but they're not going to hell. They're not going to perish. And the reason for that is mom and dad cared enough to get Jesus into the home. And that's important. Joshua 24, 14, or 24, 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods uh, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mark 8, 38 says, Whosoever there shall, shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, Joshua wasn't ashamed uh, to declare to his family, we will serve the Lord. One thing about children, they can detect a fake. You ever notice that? They know when you're fake. That's why they give you so much grief for that, for that hypocrisy <laughs> you lived in front of them. They give, until they become the hypocrite. We all know about that, right? I mean, you know, our parents were hypocrites and blah, 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 until we became the hypocrites and blah, 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 blah. That's the way it works. But um, not being ashamed of him, at least they recognize that. Uh, you think about this being America now. Um, Ezekiel 22:30, and I'm just, I've just got a few more verses here, and I'm done. It says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And I feel like that's America now. God's having a hard time. Is, you think God's actually going, thinking to himself, well, see, now I negotiated with Abraham, and if he could find ten... And is God looking at every city in America going, one, two, three? I'm wondering. He can't find a man to stand in the gap. Your children are saved. You're a good mom. You're a good dad. Because you could do far worse. They could be successful billionaires. But if they're lost, you failed them. You failed them miserably. But if they're saved, you're a winner. I want to get one of the things that um, I was very concerned about is getting my family to heaven. And that's one of the reasons why I made some of the decisions I made. Why I kept him in church. Tried to do the right thing. Tried to be a testimony in front of him. Tried to uh, magnify his word in front of him. Because I knew if I didn't, they'd grow up and get away from me and that'd be the end of it. I'd never be able to win them. And if I lived a, a total hypocrite in front of them, they wouldn't get saved. And I wasn't going to have that. And I'll tell you what, Jairus, he stepped up that day. Man, he saw the need in his family. He saw the need for Jesus Christ, and he stepped up. That's the kind of men we need in America today. The kind of men that realize what's really, really, truly important. And whether your kids live or die, that's one thing. But whether they perish is quite another. Quite another. There's some things that are painful. There are some things that are too painful to even think about. So, I think we've got some good fathers in here. And we've even, we've even got something for you, a little something we like to give you every year. I always try to pick out something that you might be able to use. I hope you get a blessing out of uh, the gift we have for you. Before you leave, make sure we give you one.
little bag there, a couple things in it. And um, I hope you have a good Father's Day. And I'm thankful. I think of all these children here. There's only, there's probably, I think there might only be one that, one or two that need to be saved just because they're too young to understand it. But a lot of them have, have already believed. You know how amazing that is? You know the burden off of you? I mean, when, that, when, when, when Rachel got saved, uh, Heather had already been saved and a couple years went down the road or maybe a year or two and then uh, Rachel got saved and did, I could just feel this, oh, this burden leave me. I told her, no more children. <laughs> I, can, I, can't ha- I can't handle it because the thought of them perishing is just, it, it's just been my worst nightmare. And um, so if you have an unsaved child, I, I, I can just imagine you keep praying you keep praying, God will intervene. You keep, as a good dad, you keep bringing, you keep bringing Jesus to them. Even if it's in prayer, you keep doing it. Let's all stand. Thank you for coming this morning. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll, we'll give you a gift. Father, we do thank you for the gift of eternal life, and we thank you for the gift of.